All right. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I would like to take you back to hear about two decades ago when I was a grad student. At the time, I had a homepage. I had a homepage for several years. And one thing that I noticed is that I wasn't the only one who was linking to my friends' homepages. My friends were also linking to others' homepages. This was before Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those social networks. And one day, I decided to map this out. And my friend Eitan Adar decided to do the equivalent for MIT. And this is what we saw. It was a social network that I had not seen before. And when we looked at what might explain some of those ties, we aggregated the words occurring on the home pages. And we realized that for MIT, you would more often see that it was predictive um, when a dorm or a fraternity or a sorority was mentioned. And for Stanford, it was much more the activities that were mentioned in this context. And I said, huh, actually, this kind of makes sense. Because at MIT at the time, and maybe still today, people tended to live in the same place um, during their entire time there. And at Stanford, you had to re-enter the housing lottery every year. And so I realized not only is there fascinating data about online interactions, but this is also telling us something about the world around us. We can learn about it. So let me tell you about some of the things that fascinate me today, both what we can learn about interactions on Facebook and about the world. So one project I'm particularly excited about that Paige Moss on my team and others at Facebook have been working on is disaster mapping. So when there's a natural disaster, an earthquake or a flood, Facebook will share aggregate data um, based on de-identified data on um, where you would expect people to be logging in to Facebook from, but they're not, or there are fewer people. And from this, you could infer that either people have evacuated to a different location or um, that perhaps connectivity has been lost. And sharing this data with relief organizations helps them focus their efforts. One other thing you might ask is now that there's so many people connected through Facebook, how many hops exactly does it take to get from one individual to any other on the globe uh, through friendship ties, Facebook friendship ties? And this was actually an interesting technical challenge. And you can read the blog post how to do this estimate, not just overall, but for each individual to generate their average number of intermediaries to anyone else on the globe. And this turned out to be 3.5 intermediaries, or equivalently 4.5 hops. Many people on Facebook also have their parents on Facebook. And if both the individual and their parent happen to have filled out their occupation in their profile, we can actually see whether what your parent did or does um, has influence on what you do. And sure, if your parent is a lawyer, you're probably several times more likely to be a lawyer than the random you know, person. But most people are striking out on their own career paths. So you can keep that in mind as you <laughs> decide on your own uh, career trajectory. My favorite topic and what I'll be talking about um, for most of this talk is information and how it diffuses through networks. This is a particular instance of a meme called the Gratitude Challenge, where people will post what they're thankful for, some number of items per day for a given number of days. And then others will copy that and also say what they're grateful for. And we can find, through regular expression matching, such status updates and automatically process them um, to find frequently occurring n-grams, which we can cluster to understand what people are mentioning. And perhaps because of the context, a lot of people mention friends and family. Uh, others will mention um, being grateful for their health or having a job. We can also look at what people are grateful for 
over time as they age. Um, so even though coffee is a relatively infrequently ma mentioned item, the ages at which it is mentioned tends to correlate with first school and then a uh, job and then kids. So for the rest of the talk, I'll mention several more in-depth studies about understanding information diffusion phenomena on Facebook. So for example, if we think of the gratitude challenge, could we have predicted that so many people would have posted what they're grateful for? And in general, if you take anything, and in the study we took um, publicly uploaded photos, could you predict which ones are going to uh, generate this very large cascade, meaning that um, it's uploaded, someone shares it, someone else reshares from them, etc., etc. And the problem, in a way, is not very well formulated, or it's actually too easy, because the vast majority of things that um, are online never propagate, and so you could just say, nope, it won't, and you'll be right most of the time. However, the things that we tend to see tend to be the more popular things, the less frequently occurring but very uh, broadly distributed items. And so what we want is a more general way of formulating the problem. Fortunately, power law distributions, which tend to govern the number of reshares per photo, and especially if the uh, power law exponent is two, which it is, have this neat property that if you take all of the cascades that have reached size k, half of them are going to be of size between k and 2k, and half of them are going to be of size greater than 2k. So if you're used to doing prediction problems and training and so on, this is great because you have this balanced set that you're trying to predict. And what's better, at any stage in the cascade's life, you could still ask this question, is the cascade going to double? We looked at many different features. The ones that I was rooting for, being uh, a social networks researcher, were ones having to do with the structure of the cascade. We can also look for these features, how their importance varies as the cascade grows larger. Some will become more important, some less. And these features did pretty decently, although their importance tended to vein. Um, so for example, if people who are sharing this particular photo tend to be friends, meaning that the subgraph is dense, the cascade is less likely to grow further because it's being localized in the network. On the other hand, if the depth is growing, meaning that it's propagating through the network, you would predict that the cascade is going to get larger. But your favorite features aren't always the ones that went out. So it was the temporal features that were most predictive. So what is the rate at which the image is being viewed? Or is the time interval between uh, subsequent shares decreasing? And if it's decreasing, that means that um, the, the meme is going at a nice clip or even accelerating, and so you're going to get a larger cascade. So when we look at this prediction problem, in this case, the temporal features won out, but if we take away the temporal features, other features, including the structural features, do well in predicting. Now there's another interesting part to um, this problem, which is that when you decide on the problem, you decide how you're going to collect and define the data set. And we thought, well, you know, most of these things run their course in a month. So we're going to get a month's worth of data and predict all the cascades uh, within that month. But um, for some of the uh, photos, especially memes, we had a bit of deja vu about them. And we said, well, okay, what if we look for a longer time period, not just a month, what if we look over a year? And this is an example of an image meme. And it actually came back quite a lot, but it had fairly dormant uh, periods in between. So this is an interesting problem. Could you have predicted that given this 
say, initial peak where you observe this popular photo, that there will be subsequent peaks. There are properties of the initial peak that are predictive. For example, if it's a broader peak, meaning that there's more sustained interest, uh, it's more likely to recur. If it was more popular, it's also more likely to recur. But this is true up to a point. If the item is so popular that so many people share it, a lot of the relevant audience is going to have already seen it. So when it comes back, it doesn't have as much of a shot. So we actually could relatively well predict the um, recurrence, whether it will happen or not, whether that second peak is going to be uh, of similar uh, size or smaller. The thing that we could not predict was when it was going to recur. So um, there's still <laughs> work to be done. Um, and interestingly, another thing that in the initial study, we, we looked at multiple copies of the same image, and we used it as a control to control for the content and look at other features and try to predict the cascade. But here, the fact that there are multiple copies in and of itself was predictive of whether the, um, the image would recur. Another thing that's not captured by these simple models that are primarily of photos for which you could click a button and reshare is that the information itself may be changing. When I, I said the word meme several times, and that is an analogy to gene, and genes can uh, change over time, and they also replicate. So in this study, which used data from uh, quite a number of years ago, we wanted to see how far we could take that analogy. So here is a meme in support of the Affordable Health Care Act. And that is just one version. And since it's text, when it gets copied, so actually here's a gene. It looks similar in a way. It's the, it's, there's some information and also some copy instructions. So at the bottom, there's copy instructions. And similarly for a gene, the gene will have instructions for how it should be copied. So one nice thing about, uh, <laughs> I guess, the online environment is that people tend to introduce humor. So um, they might change things around. Instead of about healthcare, it's about beer. And uh, coffee somehow always comes up as well. So you know, no one should fall asleep because they cannot afford coffee. Um, then for other people, they like to talk about zombies, so this is what you should do in case of zombie attack, but no, no, shooting them is not right. At some point, this gets changed and you should decapitate the zombie. And these variants occur in different numbers. The question is, could you have predicted this? And there's a model uh, by Yule in 1924 that exactly captures this. If the process is just that there are copies being made at some random, at some steady rate, and uh, either it's a mutation or an exact copy, you can predict what the distribution of copies per variant will be. And it depends just simply on this one parameter, the mutation rate. When we plot the distribution of variants for the memes, we see similar, a similar relationship. And we can capture this with the Gini coefficient, which just gives us a single number corresponding to how skewed the distribution is of the variants. And for the image on the right, which are the memes that are actually transmitted in a way such that the mutation rate can be measured, the agreement is um, actually really good. This, this model fits, and for the memes that don't fit, they're like the gratitude challenge meme. They ask people to mutate the meme every time they copy by adding their own unique uh, parts. So even the ones that don't fit, we understand why they don't fit. You can create a phylogenetic tree. Um, so someone had changed the rest of the day to the next 24 hours. That's shown in red. And that then uh, was present in many of the derivative uh, variants from that initial 24-hour variant. We can also measure the edit distance and find that um, as 
the meme propagates, the more steps it has taken, the, the greater the edit distance. So it just continues to change. We just kind of went for it and said, OK, are there other parallels? In genes, there, the edits tend to be at the beginning and the end. In memes, in copy-paste memes, the same tends to hold. For bacteria, there's an advantage to being shorter, to not having unnecessary information in your genome. And we find the same thing with memes. Within a meme, the variants that are slightly shorter have an advantage. At some point, they get too short, and then it's not advantageous anymore, but being shorter is good. And the reason why bacteria can get away with this is because they have lateral gene transfer, meaning that little useful bits that make you more fit, like having clear copy-paste instructions or saying like, paste this if you love your, you know, <laughs> um, those things will actually be transferred between memes. And so the memes can stay short while kind of benefiting from the presence of other memes. We even found fusion. It was confusing. It was confusing the automated clustering that we were using in order to identify the memes, but there it was. Um, maybe I'll just summarize. So thanks for <laughs> listening to what I'm passionate about, which is understanding different phenomena in social networks. There are many more questions that data science can answer, and specifically, there's much, much more uh, Facebook research, and there are a bunch of us here, Esteban and Jess, so I hope you'll, uh, you'll reach out and talk to us. Thanks. Great presentation. Just a question. So this information is really interesting. It's fascinating of all of this um, analysis. What do you do with this? What is the purpose of tracking these memes? What, what's next? Uh -huh. So in general, we want to understand what the different factors are that shape the information environment. So different kinds of information will um, be distributed differently. Um, there are, I mean, there are a lot of behavioral signals, for example, that can um, be related, that, that correlate with the quality of the information that is propagating. So while a lot of this was a really deep dive into the phenomena of information cascades, there's also a lot of research that goes uh, directly into improving uh, our signals about uh, uh, the signals for ranking and, and other reasons. One, one more qu uh, last quick question. Yep. Sure. I was curious, uh, how are you collaborating with social scientists and anthropologists uh, with regards to some of these theories? Uh -huh. so in, in this case, actually, uh, it was a collaboration with Pauline Eng, who's a geneticist, but we do regularly collaborate uh, with uh, social scientists. So, for example, uh, Will Hobbs uh, and James Fowler at UCSD uh, on uh, understanding um, mortality and uh, social networks. Uh, um, yeah, so <laughs> there, there, there are actually many collaborations in particular for other uh, topics, for example, bullying or um, uh, those kinds of subjects. There are pretty deep collaborations with the academic community. Yeah. Well, well, thanks very much, Thank Lada, you. for your talk. And she and other Facebook people are around. <laughs> <laughs>